Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar on the series of two webinars dedicated to communication. Last week, we had on the side of communicating, telling people your message, and this week, we are going to listen about how to improve our listening, a challenge for some, which I think I include myself. I prefer to talk than to listen. Uh, so my name is Louisa Freire and I'm the responsible for the social program at the EIB Institute. And I have with me today, Kim Van Ikerke. She is a personal communication consultant and a lecturer at, at the Institute of Fundraising in UK. Before I give Kim the, the, the mic, just some logistic uh, uh, remarks. First, this webinar will be available in our YouTube channel in a couple of days, along with all the other webinars we've been uh, hosting for the last uh, two years, directed at uh, SIT alumni and social impact change makers. Second, if you want to interact with us, you'll have at the bottom of the screen the option of sending a, a message on chat. You can ask questions on Q&A, and if you use either or, please choose the option all the panelists so we can all see your questions and feedback. And you also can uh, hit the, the feedback button. I, at the end of the Kim's presentation, we'll have some time for uh, questions. Please use the Q&A box for that. And also, you know, might be the opportunity if you want to give us your personal feedback live. We may, if we have time, promote you to panelists as well so you can share some of your feedback with all. So without further ado, Kim, the mic is yours. Thank you so much. Now this is my absolute pleasure to be spending time talking about this, the listening gearbox. So let me take you through what we're planning on covering in today's session. So we are basically going to talk about, very briefly I'm going to share the inspiration behind this concept and then I'm going to take you through the six listening gears as, um, as we've pulled them together so far and then we'll have some time at the end for your questions and uh, a quick poll at the end before you disappear would be great. Now, I really, really love this topic of listening and in particular this listening gearbox, partly because every time I talk about it or teach it in sessions or I'm working with like clients, the, the brilliant thing is that I go away remembering how important these things are. So all of my family and my friends benefit massively from this constant reminder that there are different ways to be thinking. And it really is uh, a superpower listening. It's absolutely incredible what it can achieve. So I hope you will share the next hour with me, bringing your best listening to this to take away as many new tips to find your new listening superpower. So let me tell you a little bit more about the inspiration for this. Uh, now, as a concept, I think I remember learning a long time ago, I can't even remember where, about the difference between active listening and passive listening. And I think most of us have come across it in some shape or form. We might not necessarily be taught it at school or even at universities, but by the time we get into the workplace, people are starting to talk about active and passive listening. So passive listening, where you are just hearing the words active listening where you are processing the meaning of the words being said and you're much much more attentive now what we want to do is take it to the next level and one of the, the places i was inspired to take listening to the next level was uh listening to a brilliant talk by uh, an mit professor called otto sharma he talks about levels of listening I'm really going to recommend you go and have another look at it as well. I'll make sure that um, in the link that goes out to the video, you get the link to his presentation. But it was a really nice wake up call for me that there are filters we can put on our listening that can help us to listen in very different ways. So that was one of the, the next stages of inspiration. And then 
it's basically grown from that to start thinking about actually there are a number of different filters we can put on our listening. And then I was on LinkedIn one day and saw uh, a colleague uh, called Annie Clark, who runs a great training company. And she posted up a concept about thinking about listening in terms of gears. And I just thought that was absolutely brilliant because we do need to be able to think about moving our listening into different gears, depending on the different situations we find ourselves in. So that's the inspiration behind this concept. And I really want to call this type of listening conscious listening. So it's a step beyond active listening. It is really about being completely conscious of the style of listening you are using and consciously choosing the style of listening that's going to help you in any given situation. Uh, one of the questions we had ahead of the seminar talked about whether you need to have good empathy to be a good listener. And absolutely, I mean, empathy helps. But actually, as long as you are conscious of the style of listening you are using, you can be a phenomenal listener. So let's dive in and we'll start looking at what some of these uh, gears start to look like. So the first gear that I want to share with you is the not listening gear. And I know this sounds a little bit ridiculous, but this is a bit like the reverse gear on the gearbox. It's the one we don't want to be in, but it's the one we want to be conscious of being in if we're there. Now, I can, I'm sure many, many, many of you have had those moments that you've been sat in meetings or on Zoom calls, and you suddenly realize you haven't heard anything the person has just been saying. It might already have happened to you on this session already. Just um, type into the chat box for me quickly a yes if you've ever had it happen to you. So if you've ever found all of a sudden you look around and like, I've totally not heard anything that person was saying. Pop it into that chat box for me. And in fact, one of the most, thank you, loving all the confessions, yes, I think we're human, we've all been there. Now, one of the things that's so important for us to do is realize how damaging that can be when we're in a conversation. It's innocent. A lot of the time we've got really busy minds, but it's uh, you know, we slip away from the conversation and don't realize how much impact it can have. There's a lovely exercise I love to do with people in a room where we basically pair people up and one person tells a story about something going on in their lives and the other person completely ignores them, like, you know, really looking around the room, focusing on everything else except for what's going on, uh, what the person is sharing. And it has a very profound impact. It it switches people off, it makes them feel irritated, it makes them feel disconnected. Uh, but when it is done consistently, it has an incredibly negative effect. And in fact, I remember going to a session where someone did this exercise and I was a participant. And I remember thinking, what's the easiest thing I can quickly talk about with the chap that I was with? And I said, okay, well, I'm going to talk for two minutes just about my son. And the guy that I was working with did such a good job at not listening. And I think I've shared this story with some of you that by the end of the two minutes, well, first of all, I gave up at about halfway through. I just didn't want to talk about my son anymore. But this tiny little thought crept into my mind of maybe I don't love my son as much as I thought I did because he's not, it's not that interesting. And, and we have these terrible thoughts that can creep in that aren't true, that by not listening to people, you can sow seeds of doubt, a bit of paranoia, um, but you can basically make someone feel so uncertain of what they're saying that it has an incredibly negative effect. So what I want to stress is that whilst we all do this, when it's really important, and even when it's not so important, being present with people is one of the most incredible things we can do, one of the most important things we can do. So I want you to constantly be thinking about, am I damaging conversation by not being present? And 
where is my focus when I'm not present? What am I being preoccupied by? What am I thinking about? And often we're thinking about what we need to make for dinner or the, the things on our to-do list or the emails we haven't responded to, and that's fine, but it's not helping us have a powerful conversation with somebody. So ask yourself, where do I tend to drift off to? And how can I start training myself to just quickly come back to the conversation? And I, everyone who's worked with me will know that I'm a huge advocate for mindfulness. And meditation training, uh, breath meditation training, is absolutely brilliant for this. Because what you're doing is you close your eyes and you're focusing just on your breath. But every time your mind wanders off to your to-do list or your shopping list, you just bring it back and you come back to the breath. And it's part of how you can start training your brain to stop moving into this not listening gear. So please know how powerfully damaging it can be, but also know that you can practice getting much better at this and being present. So let's move on from noticing that this is one of the gears we can be in, even if it is a reverse gear, into having a look at another gear. Now, we're also in a slightly reverse gear for this one. I kind of feel like, if reverse had a first gear, this would be it. And it's what I'm calling the fixed mindset gear. Also, not a very powerful place for us to listen from. Now, some of you will have come across um, Carol Dweck and her research into growth mindset. And she's really the person who coined these terms of fixed mindset and growth mindset. And again, I'm sure lots of you have heard of these two concepts. But her research showed that fixed mindset was really a group of people who had decided they were certain things. So they were certain attributes, certain behaviors, they had certain characteristics, and that couldn't change. And growth mindset was defined as a mindset that said, I just haven't achieved some of those other attributes, skills, behaviors yet. So I can. So there's always this possibility that you could be something more with growth mindset. And my businesses are, um, uh, and organizations are really pumping in this idea of growth mindset because it's so powerful. But if we are listening in fixed mindset, what's really happening is that we are listening through a filter of what we have decided is already fact or already a quality of somebody that you're talking to. So it means we've already decided what's going to happen in the conversation, how someone else is going to behave in that conversation. And again, we do this naturally all the time. Um, I think that if you have a look at Otto Sharma's um, a uh, piece on the levels of listening. This is what he would call past experience listening. So you've had a past experience where you've been in a meeting before, you've been on a webinar before, you've been on a training session before, and you've already decided how it's going to go, or you've already decided how that person's going to behave. And what happens is that it's very, very hard for anyone to show up in any other capacity than the one you've decided they're going to be. So we tend to start seeing things like um, people saying, oh, I already know that this person is going to be difficult in this meeting. And so all you're listening for is that person showing up as difficult. So we have a fixed mindset on them. And I want you just to get a real feel for how dangerous this can be, is to write down very quickly for me a list of two or three of your best qualities and two or three of your worst qualities okay so have a go at just playing that out you don't have to share this with us but we well, just have it in your mind if you don't have anything to write anything down but what are two or three of your best and two or three of your worst qualities so we're, we're probably quite clear on these for ourselves now I'll share with you mine so I would say that one of my, uh, my worst qualities can be procrastinating. I can be a really bad procrastinator. And one of my best qualities is um, being passionate about the work that I do. 
So I'm loving. Thank you to those of you who are sharing some of your best. So empathy, kindness, availability, commitment, some of your worst being stubborn. Brilliant. Now, what I want to get you to do for me, and I'd love you to type this into the chat box, is if you only saw me as a procrastinator, how would it shape your interaction with me? So type that into the chat box. If you only saw me as someone who procrastinated and didn't get on with things, and you had to work with me as a colleague, how would that shape your interaction with me? If what you listened to and decided in this fixed mindset listening is that I'm a procrastinator, <laughs> so I'm loving, Marta, I love, I love that you're relating to it, you fellow procrastinator. Good. Anyone else feel like they could be, and be honest, because I think if I had labeled someone as a procrastinator, I'd probably avoid giving them particular types of work, or I'd have to try and convince them. You'd have to set deadlines for all the tasks and follow up. Welcome to micromanaging. I love this. Brilliant, right? So I would probably attract quite a lot of micromanaging if I was in that space. You'd be more reserved. Brilliant. I love this. Okay, so now take a moment to reflect on how would you interact with me if what you saw me as was passionate about my work, right? How would you interact with me then? Again, pop it into the chat box. Loving those reflections you've given me. So if you've already got a fixed mindset set, love it. So you'd be passionate in return. You'd have more confidence in working with me, perhaps. Brilliant. Thanks so much, guys, for popping this feedback in. But you can see the difference. You'd listen with interest to my ideas. Great. You see the difference between the two? No micromanaging creeping in here if all you see is me being passionate. So what I really want to stress for you is how dangerous it can be if we've already listened to people and decided who they are. So if you think there are people that you have decided you already know, and you can start with those closest to you. I mean, we've already decided we know our partners and our families and our friends and, you know, then extend it into our colleagues. When actually people are dynamic and very multifaceted. So who do you need to maybe think about going back and looking at differently? Who have you already decided is something? And is that a, perhaps a little bit dangerous? So let's see if we can find some of the other listening gears. If we've been listening in fixed mindset or been listening with no listening, Let's see if we can find some others that are helpful for us to shift into. So let's have a look at the first one that I want to take you through, which is the mindful self gear. Now, this is all about thinking about moving out of these less helpful gears um, and into something that starts to check where am I listening from in this moment? So one of the things you might start going is, wow, by being more mindful of this, I've maybe I've been in no listening gear or I've been in fixed mindset gear. But more than that, it's about checking what's going on within me, where is my mindset at the moment, and how is that going to affect my listening to others? So it's really about, first of all, listening to yourself, listening to the thoughts that are going on through your head listening to the emotions that are going on, listening to the physiology, how you're feeling in your body at any given moment. When was the last time you went into a meeting and thought, just going to check where my mindset is. I'm going to check what's the focus of my thoughts, what's the focus, where are my emotions, and how am I feeling physically? But that's what it means to listen to ourselves as a gear. And things are either helpful or unhelpful. So if your mindset going into a meeting is already you notice you're feeling emotions of frustration going into a meeting because you've just come out of 
20 other back-to-back -back meetings and you're going into this one exhausted and frustrated. Well, it's true, that's where you're at, but we have to be able to have a conversation and say, is this gonna help me in this meeting? Am I gonna get the most out of it by being in this mindset? So I'm gonna really encourage you to go back and have a look at some of the other webinars we've done as part of this series, because we've really covered this so nicely. But it's beautiful just to journal uh, how, what's going on. You know, what are you, what are you thinking about in any given moment? How are you feeling? And ask yourself, are these things helpful or unhelpful as my focus for going into the meeting? And even thinking about if you're going into a meeting and your focus is on everything people have done wrong on a project, is that helping you or not helping you get the outcomes that you're wanting to ahead of moving into that meeting? So it's really about tuning in, checking where you're at, where are you starting the day, and is that going to help you? So that's our mindful self-gift, listening, first of all, to ourselves. And then we can start talking about the curiosity year. So we've checked in, actually probably with a bit of curiosity into ourselves with our mindful listening gear. But this is probably one of the most powerful gears you can move into when you're communicating with people and really listening to them. And it's like listening through a lens that says, I know, I want to know more. Uh, in fact, some of the best communicators that I know are always asking themselves, what do I not know about this situation, about this person, instead of, this is what I know about this situation, this is what I know about this person, which can lead you into quite strong fixed mindset listening gear. So the curiosity gear is about us accessing our ignorance of really saying, what is it I don't know in this moment? And I want you to think about somebody who maybe you've got quite a lot of fixed mindset about, you've already decided who they are. Have a little think about what are some of the questions that you would love to ask to find out more about them or parts of the project that you haven't asked questions on? What is it you don't know about? And it's quite hard. Have a go at just typing into the chat box for me some of the questions you think, actually, I haven't asked this question. I don't know this. If I was going to get really curious, what else could I ask them about? What do I not know about them? What do I not know about this project? So we start with our listing being about what we don't know, not what we do know. See if some of you can pop into the chat box for me some of the questions. You're like, oh, actually, I don't know this about that person. What do you fear? What an amazing question. I love that. Thank you, Carlo. So, um, you know, we don't know what people fear, what they're worried about, perhaps. Brilliant question to ask. And in fact, if any of you, what are the most difficult things for you? Like Veronica, great question as well. Um, you know, what a wonderful thing to start a meeting or be in, in a meeting really posing these kinds of questions to listen better, to show someone that we care to understand these things. Now, our brains are wired for confirmation. So if you've already made a load of decisions about somebody from your fixed mindset listening, um, it's hard to suddenly go, oh, what do I not know? So if any of you are finding it hard to think about questions that you don't have answers for, uh, it's because your brain is going, no, 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 I know them. I know the situation. I know, I know, I know. But it's wonderful to think about becoming much more like a child, you know, the, the child that says, but why? And then you give an answer and they say, but why? And then you give an answer. You know, their minds are so beautifully curious. And at some point in our growth to adulthood, we tend to kill this curiosity off. But really sitting there and with this marvel and wonder at the people around you, the projects around you, the organizations around you, go in with this beautiful curiosity. 
it's a little like uh, walking into a warehouse. We tend to uh, walk into a very dark warehouse and turn on a torch, like a spotlight, and we look around at this very narrow beam, and we ask questions in a very narrow parameter. And what I want to get you thinking about is, are there other parts of this warehouse you need to investigate with this beam? Or indeed, do you need to switch on the lights for the whole warehouse and have a good look at it? And what would the questions be that allow you to see so much more and understand so much more? Um, brilliant. So that's our curiosity gear. And I want you to just literally try going into a meeting or a conversation with someone and just saying, I'm going to just, the thing I'm going to do is sit in curiosity. Just going to look for the things I don't know. I'm going to ask questions to get insight on what I don't know. It's a really, really powerful space to go to, and you'll learn things that you had never imagined. So let's have a look at our connection gear. Now, our connection gear is um, not about... Um, what do we have in common with people? But it's a way of listening that says, what do I like about you? I might not have this in common with you, but I really like it. Or I really admire something about the way the project's been run or about you as a person. Um, what do I respect about how this is being operated or about you? What do I even really love about what's going on here? So it is listening in order to find a connection, but it doesn't mean listening to similarity. And I think over the years with uh, a lot of the trainings that I've been on and trainings I've delivered, people often talk to me about how do I build rapport with somebody, you know, especially if I don't have anything in common with them. And uh, one of the things that always strikes me as really interesting is that we think we have to have a match with somebody, that we have to be in exactly the same space as them to really feel a good like, connection. But actually, when we're all human beings, and we can all be very, very different, that we can find a connection with people in order to create that sense of rapport by listening for what do I like what do I love? What do I respect? What do I admire about someone? And this is particularly powerful um, in a space where you have a difficult relationship with somebody. I remember distinctly uh, working with a coachee who was having a really tough time with his boss. And he was getting so frustrated that the boss wanted to uh, you know, just take a particular direction and the coach, he was saying, and he's neglecting the numbers and I'm, I'm here worrying about the numbers and my boss just isn't even thinking about the numbers. And as we talked, we started realizing that there was a lot of judgment involved. And judgment is a killer for listening. So if you feel judgment creeping in, and I think, again, it's something we all do, um, be very mindful of noticing the judgment that creeps up in you. But he admitted to, and being very judgmental about his leadership and about his approach to managing. And so we had to kill off the judgment. And one of the ways we found to be able to do that really effectively was to talk about, okay, so you don't have similar approaches to decision-making, but what, connection can we create? What do you admire? What do you like? What do you respect about him? And as we started talking, he started reflecting and saying, actually, it took him a little while. He said, you know, actually, one of the things I really admire about him is how he talks about his family. And all of a sudden, I just watched my coach just soften, he just relax. I really like that bit about him. I like how he talks about his family. And it was a beautiful moment because there was all of a sudden an empathy there that hadn't been there before. And as we started saying, hey, what else do you like about him? He said, well, I like that he employs great people. Good. And I said, why did he employ you? He said, because I care about the numbers. 
And all of a sudden, this little light bulb went off in his head of, oh, maybe he doesn't need to worry about the numbers because he employed me to worry about the numbers. And then we started talking about, well, how would this change your interaction with this person if you're listening through what you do admire about them? And he said, actually, I'm likely to go to meetings and instead of making him wrong because he's not worrying about the numbers, I'll show him that he's got me and I'm worrying about the numbers. And when I said, well, how will that affect how you think he will interact with you? He said, well, he'll probably feel less criticized. He'll probably appreciate me more. So just by listening through a different connection gear, and you don't have to be live in the room with someone to do this. It's the best thing. You can listen through what, where is there the connection? which I think is a really beautiful, powerful tool of how we can stop interacting with each other just through our listening in ways that create in-groups and out-groups. I mean, think about how many meetings you're having at the moment and what we're going into with those meetings is a listening for who thinks like me, who thinks differently, in-group, out-group, and how damaging that is for you getting things done and how much more powerful it could be to listen for what do I admire, what do I like, what do I respect. So I would love you just to have a think for me of who is it that's a difficult character for you to work with? Who uh, do you think if you had a better working relationship, it would be so much more helpful for you? And then I'm going to encourage you to go into a conversation, go into a meeting with them, having already thought about what do I like, admire, respect, value, appreciate about this person, and sit and do it in meetings with people. It's really powerful for first meetings when you are meeting someone for the first time and you, it's important that you build a sense of rapport and you can physically see somebody doing it. So if I say to you, listen in connection gear, uh, I don't know how many of you can see me as well as the slides at the moment, but it's literally, you, if you're listening to somebody through connection listening, you're literally just going, the only thing I'm looking for is what I love, like, admire about you. It's a bit like love hearts start coming out of your eyes. Um, you know, it's really a powerful thing and people are just staring at each other. I'm, the only thing I'm looking for is what I like about you. Um, it's really, really powerful. So I'm gonna encourage you to think about who do you want to go and practice this type of listening with today? Go and do it today. And in fact, I think that the dating scene, having seen some TV lately, where I was watching people on first date, I think what we tend to do is look for the things that we don't have in common. If we looked in each other for all the things we liked and admired, I think people would have a much happier dating scene, but that's an aside. Right, so the next one that I wanted to share with you, and the last one of these six gears, is the what's important to them gear. And uh, some of you were just starting to process uh, this as a gear uh, a little bit earlier on, I think. But it's about saying, it's probably the one that's closest to the concept of active listening, actually. But it's active listening of what are they trying to communicate? What is the meaning behind what they're saying? But it, it's, so we're, we're really, we're hearing words, but we're doing some really hard work as we're listening, processing, what does this tell me is important to them? What does this tell me I need that, they, that they're trying to show me? And we're doing it, processing that, that information, and at the same time, listening with a lens of kindness associated with so we're not judging them as we're listening and trying to process the meaning behind what's going on <clears throat> and again I've got a lovely story from someone I was coaching who was uh jumped onto the call with me and oh my word she was so frustrated and I said what's what's going on she said, I've just come out of a meeting and I've just had a colleague who got so angry and so frustrated about the project that we were working on and 
everyone got defensive about the project and the entire meeting just disintegrated. And I think, again, almost all of us could relate to that. And, and we've all probably been in meetings where someone got really angry, really frustrated, and then everyone started defending their positions and it all fell apart. And I said to her, okay, so this is what she was saying. So she was saying these words and it was coming out with anger and coming out with frustration and everyone just retaliated. But if we could process it for a moment through our, like this active listening of saying what is important to them, what would you describe? Like I'm, I'm actively listening of what's important to them, but with this lens of kindness. So we're not getting angry at them and judging them. We are going, wow, what, what's going on for them right now? And when she reflected on it, she just took a big deep breath in and she said, oh, you know what? I just think they're really worried. They really want this project to go well. It's really important to them that the deadline is hit and that we achieve all of these outcomes. And all of a sudden, there was no defensiveness in her tone, in her approach, because she processed the deeper meaning of what was important to the person that she was with. And I said, how can you imagine feeding back to them and saying, I can see how worried you are about this project. I can see that you want it to go well. I can see that it's important to you that we hit these deadlines and these milestones. If you said that back to them, what do you think their response would have been? And she, she said, so they probably would have laughed at me and said, yes, yes. You know, with this like relief of you've understood me. Uh, and, and so it was a really nice way of going actually this is how you can move conversations on by listening to what someone is trying to tell you, even if they're doing a really messy job of it. And we all do very messy jobs of, of communicating. So, uh, so I, she said, no, I can absolutely imagine there would be a really positive response to summarizing what I'd understood was important to somebody. And, and I think this is one of the most powerful techniques is if you can, and I often talk to people and I say, it's the equivalent of sitting on top of a conversation instead of sitting underneath or in the conversation. Being in the conversation is now going for like round two in the boxing ring of, you know, one person shouting, the other person shouting back because you're being defensive. Being on top of the conversation is listening to where is this coming from? Why are they responding like this? Why are they sharing this? Um, and where, you know, what is going on? Even if someone is not listening to you, it's really this sense of why? What's going on for them right now? That we've got this curiosity here. And then we go, what's important to them right now? So we're starting to process what people are trying to share. And that's really important because as human beings, we are bad at communicating. Bad at communicating what's really important to us. Um, I think that one of the, the most beautiful examples I've had of this was teaching a session. And I had um, one of the delegates in the room suddenly got really angry and lashed out at me, you know, really sort of attacking. And I think your normal reaction as a human being is to go on the defensive. Well, so this is my approach. But if I, thankfully, I was able to move into a, what's important to them gear of listening. So as they were talking, I wasn't sat there getting, you know, ready to respond and defend my approach. I was sat thinking, why is someone so angry about this? Why are they feeling so passionate about it? And so we're doing this, what's important to them. It's important that they feel safe and secure in this space, or they feel heard, or they feel like their talents are properly acknowledged, whatever it might be. And, but that led to a very, very powerful conversation I was able to have with that delegate, who by the end of it, we were exchanging telephone numbers and hugs, which was really lovely. But it's much, much more powerful to listen to somebody through that lens. So again, I want you to think about who is it 
that in particular, you'd love to go and listen to them, but listen through, not at the, what are the words they're saying, but what's important to them right now? What's going on for them right now? You could equally call this an empathy listening gear. You know, but I really want you to get to things like what's important so that we understand them. And it's a great technique with people that you find a little bit more challenging to work with as well. So that is my tour of the six gears that you can be using uh, as a way of understanding yourself, understanding others better. But I really want to come back to this idea of moving around them. So we've got this idea of noticing when I'm in not listening gear. And, and also, it's a nice thing to, re to reflect in others. You know, when is someone else in a not listening gear? What's going on for them? Where's their focus? So we can combine the observation that someone is in a not listening gear with a hmm, curiosity gear. What's, what's going on for them right now? Or what else is preoccupying them that's keeping them busy? You know, what's important to them right now? Um, we've got the past experience gear or the, the fixed mindset gear, as I called it earlier, um, uh, which is a wonderful way of us checking when am I bringing all my judgment and my fixed mindset about who somebody is into a conversation. And again, we saw how dangerous that can be. So noticing when you're in it and going, oops, let me see if I can move out of it and, and discover something that I could take away from this conversation listen to something and learn something new about a person or a project. We talked about how unbelievably powerful and important it is to have that mindful self gear where we can just check in and see what's going on for me today and how is that likely to impact my day, my work, my interactions with colleagues. Um, and taking time to listen to ourselves is so important. We talked about that curiosity gear of accessing all of our ignorance and what we don't know. And I mean, think about the vast amounts of what we don't know and the vast amounts of what we don't know we even don't know. You know, it's a huge, enormous world out there. There's so much to learn. It's so much better to be staying in curiosity gear. Then the connection gear, which is that moving into when do I need to feel a connection with somebody because it's so crucial to my work I'm going to force myself into that space. And I cannot tell you enough, if you've got a challenging relationship, this is the one I want you to try more than anything else. Go and sit and only listen to the things you love, like, respect, admire, appreciate about that person. And then start interacting with them in that place, with that part of them. And just see how transformative it is to your work. It's really powerful. And then, of course, we finished up with the what's important to them gear and talking about really deeply trying to understand people of where they're coming from, finding that empathy in order to move things forward and develop great relationships. So that's our recap of the listening gearbox. I hope you found that interesting to explore, that you're already thinking about going away and using some of them. But I'd love to take some of your questions now. Um, so we'll move on to that. And um, Louisa, I think we've had, we had some great questions coming in ahead of the session. Thank you so much. Really, really exciting uh, presentation. And before I go to the question, I'm going to ask you a, a question from myself, which is, you know, when you were speaking, you know, throughout your webinar about how people listen and those that do not listen, they can damage what you're saying. How do you handle that in the context of the webinar that you don't have the energy and you don't see whether people are listening or in which listening mode they are? And then I will go through the question. But yeah. Actually, it's so it's so fascinating because obviously we're all working on Zoom and you know these different um, places so often. And you know, you know if someone's checking their emails whilst you're having a call with them, you know if that chat box has popped up. Uh, so I think for me in these webinar sessions, I have to come from a place of assuming the best and wanting to give generously. So I give of this knowledge 
and I sort of stay quite I stay quite focused myself on what can I give as opposed to is anyone actually even there listening to me because if that was the focus of my thoughts I'd be all over the place so I have to stay focused on what I want to share and that's really such a good point because it's always about where is your focus if your focus is on the fact that people aren't listening you're in a really challenging place because it's going to derail you completely. So I would really say in spaces where you can't see what people are doing, stay focused on what you want to give. Thank you. So let's go now through the questions we have received before the, the webinar. And I would start with, uh, how can I learn not to interrupt people? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think we, we all do it. We all do it. And um, I love that this person who asked this question is so conscious that they're interrupting people. Because that's, that, that's the first thing. You've got to become aware that you do it. If you have no awareness, because you haven't done that mindful self-observation, uh, then it's really hard. But first, well done, you know you're already doing it. And then I think the second thing really is that Remember that if you do interrupt, it's okay. But just go in and you know clean it up. And when I say clean it up, apologize. Just really quickly catch yourself and say, you know, I'm so sorry. I just totally interrupted you. I really want to hear the rest of what you have to say. Can we go back and please finish you know what you were saying? So just go back, fix it. That's the best thing. But then of course, this is just about training your brain it's like inside there's just like a really energetic little puppy that wants to share content and you want to share ideas and it's about you starting to notice that your focus when you're in those meetings is on what you want to say your focus is not on what's being shared by the other people in the room so one of the best things you can start to do is check where is my focus right now am i focused on my head and my thoughts and don't worry about that. They're always going to be there. You know, you know what you want to share. But instead, perhaps put yourself into a gearbox of curiosity. Move into curiosity listening. What have I never heard them say before? What have I not understood? That forces your focus to be with the other people instead of in your head with your thoughts. Because that's going to make your puppy want to, like, jump in really quickly and say something. But I also think I would really encourage you to do that mindfulness meditation practice that I said of the breath meditation, of just training your brain every time it drifts away to come back to the breath. It's a way in which you can really, really start becoming so much better at staying focused on the one thing. But don't beat yourself up about it. We all do it. It's great that you've found that you, uh, that you do it, and hopefully those techniques help. Another one of the questions is, are there different cultural approaches to listening? Yes. There, well, I've never studied it, and this is probably enough to make me go, ooh, different cultural approaches to listening. But I know that one of the things that, uh, in fact, it was an SIT delegate, Louisa, who I remember being sat on the bus, we were moving between venues, having a great time, and he was sharing a story about how uh, in the German language, because the verb is at the end of the sentence, you really don't necessarily know what someone mm -hmm. said until they finish their sentence. And this was like a light bulb for me, because in English, then, in English, we put the verb very close to the beginning of the sentence. So we kind of assume that we know what someone's going to say and we interrupt. And that just was mind blowing for me to think about just how our sentences are structured can affect our, our listening and our interrupting. But I think one of the things I would say is that even if there are culturally different approaches, the thing is always about holding yourself accountable to how you listen. So it might be a really valuable thing for you to do. Do I ne maybe need to move into a bit more of my connective listening with someone if I'm finding our cultural differences? A bit challenging do I need to be a bit more curious you know and your patience will play out beautifully if you're using those different gears so it's a bit of a 
I don't know. I need to go and investigate this further. Um, but of course, there must be things. So I think if we move into connection and uh, curiosity listening, that'll help us no matter who we're communicating with. Okay, the next question. How do, I, how do we get others to listen? Yeah, <laughs> the million dollar question. I love this. So I'm great at listening, but how do I get everyone to listen as well? Oh my word. In fact, if anyone does have the absolute answer, I've got a five-year-old I would like them to train. Um, it's, it's a great question. I think one of the first things is, first of all, appreciating that we don't grow up being taught how to do this well. You know, the concepts we've just talked through no one's teaching this. So I think we first of all have to go, you know, we're just told to listen, you know, but not told how to listen. So I think we first of all have to go, you know, we don't get trained in this. So let's just give everyone a bit of a break. The second thing is there's potentially no reason why you can't introduce your team members to the concepts we've talked about today. You know, share the webinar, get people talking about right, shall we decide what kind of gearbox is great for us to listen in right now, you know? Or you could ask your team, I'd love everyone to bring their curious listening to this session. Or I'd love them to bring their connection listening to this session. So you can actually say, this is how I want to show up in this meeting with me today. So think about sharing the webinar. And then I guess the other point is to think, if someone isn't listening to you, which gear should you move into? Here's a question for you. If someone isn't listening to you, which listening gear should you use with them? I don't know if anyone wants to pop their answer into the chat box. But ask them questions, Carl, I love that. So that would be your curious, like what's going on for them? Brilliant. You could also move into the um, what's important to them right now? Like, what's going on for them? What's, where's their focus if their focus isn't on me and what I'm saying? What is keeping them busy? So go in and be curious. Brilliant. Because it's so much more important to say, you know, you seem really preoccupied. You seem really, like, worried about other things or that you're, you're thinking about other stuff. What's going on? What are you worrying about? Because what that does is allow you to, like, clear the deck, address what's keeping their mind busy, and then once they've done that, they can bring their focus back to you and where you're at. So you can use your own gearbox to bring them into being a much, much more present with you as well. So I hopefully, hopefully that's a, a couple of ideas for you to get people thinking about how um, they can listen better. But it's a little bit similar to the question, Louisa, did we get something about um, how I can get people to listen to me better? Yes, we have the, the most effective way to make the others listen to me. So I wasn't going to, because I think you've already responded to in the other one. Yeah, I don't know, well, if you want to add something? There's a, there's a slight, like, sort of step on that. So one is, you know, people don't listen. Well, those are techniques we just cover for how you can help them listen better, you know, bring them to a place of being present with you and, and share these ideas with them. But the idea of how do I make, make people listen to me is a little bit more about the gravitas that you have and how you're delivering your messaging. And, and I, again, I want you to check with your mindful self-listening gear where is your focus? Because a lot of the time, we've already now gone into fixed mindset about ourselves. No one listens to me. I go into this meeting and this person never listens to me. And we've already made that decision. And so that's how things show up every single time. They don't listen to me. And your focus is on, they don't listen to me. And I want you to just notice that that actually is just such an unhelpful mindset for you to carry around with you. Um, the session we did last week, Louisa, on um, preparing for powerful communication, uh, those mindsets, would be a great webinar for you to listen to. 
because we really talked about checking in with like, am I so focused on the fact that people aren't listening to me that I have not started thinking about well, how does that make me come across? If you've got those thoughts, I can tell you now, your body language is very, it's very closed. Your energy flows into yourself because no one wants to listen to you. Um, and you just are not creating a connection with people at all. So, so that's often about your own mindset more than anything else. I'm looking for the other questions. You know, the technology is uh, <laughs> is challenging. So, uh, I think I have one final question, which is, can we listen differently in a pandemic? Can we listen differently in a pandemic? I want to. There's another one. I want to say yes. Of course, we can listen, but I think it's it. it it's that, to some extent, it, it shouldn't take a pandemic for us to listen differently. There should always be a reason for us to listen differently. Um, I think perhaps being in a pandemic is getting us to listen a lot more compassionately. Perhaps we are listening, um, perhaps that's the seventh gear, listening with compassion is a distinct thing. Um, perhaps that perhaps it has allowed us to listen with a lot more compassion to others, uh, or with a lot more patience. I mean, really, these gears can be filled with whatever you want to fill them with. Um, so yeah, perhaps it has, and that's a really lovely way of actually it's a beautiful way to listen to the world and to listen to people is to listen with compassion, listen with kindness, which is probably linked to that. Um, you know, listen to what's important to people and to listen with kindness with that space. So it probably has allowed us to do that more, but whether we stay listening that way and whether we practice that gear is another thing. I would love to see us doing that more. I still have one question of those that we received, which is, can you define the working style of someone by listening to their words? By listening to their words, can you define the listening style of someone, the style, the working style by listening to their words. Yes, but you'd need to check it. So if you are listening with curiosity to the types of work people are using, so if somebody references targets and numbers, or if someone references processes and procedures and ways to do things a lot in their words, or if they process new ideas and innovations, or if they, pro if they use words really connected to people um, and how teams run and a sense of unity, yes, you absolutely can start to work out what their working style, their working preferences are. Um, so it's a beautiful technique. I think you're, you need to be careful you don't bring judgment with that listening. So you can definitely look at their style of what's important to them, brilliant. If you're listening to what's important to them from what they're sharing in terms of their words, it's important that we hit deadlines or it's important that we're ambitious or it's important that we like working with each other or it's important that we're trying new things, that we're doing with that eye of kindness all the time. So certainly we can, we can definitely listen to that um, but I think it's also important that we check. So going in and saying, from what you've been sharing, it sounds like what is important to you is. It sounds like your focus for your working style is this. And really go in and check it with them because um, we can make mistakes in how we're interpreting it. So yes, but go and check. Thank you, Kim. I don't think I have any other question. If someone wants to ask any other question before the end of the webinar, just uh, write it in the Q&A. Otherwise, thank you so much for uh, having been with us today. This is the last webinar before the summer break, and we'll be having some surprises for you after the summer break. Thank you, Led. My thank you for joining me. Have a wonderful summer. I look forward to seeing you at a late stage when everyone's back. And thank you again.